Well, I hate to interrupt all the conversations, but it's time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Before we open in prayer, I want to remind everybody, if you're able to be there, National Day of Prayer tomorrow at the caboose at uh, 6.30, and uh, I'm, I'm told that there will be uh, hot dogs and potato chips and something to drink for everybody, so that's always good, amen? And so I encourage you to come if you can, it's always a good time, get the community together, and we pray and, and uh, fellowship and have a good time, amen? Praise the Lord. Uh, seems like there was something else I was going to mention, but uh, I can't remember. So, what's that? Yes, Jerry's coming. He'll be here. Um, uh, Mulligan, that's something in golf. <laughs> that's what I hear anyway. I don't play golf. Never give you enough. Uh, but yeah, Jerry Milliken will be here. Uh, he's coming in Thursday evening late, so he'll be here tomorrow evening late, and then uh, uh, he's going out on the streets Friday. So if anybody's interested in going out on the streets and learning from him, hey, he'd be glad to take you along. Amen? And uh, you know, uh, what I usually do when I go with him is, is he's preaching, he's got his machine with his amplifier, and he's preaching, and I'm starting conversations. I'm going out and trying to look for the people that are engaged, listening to what he's saying or what maybe somebody else is, because there's going to be multiple people preaching on the streets, and, and, and I'll, I'll try to find, I'll look in the crowd and try to find somebody that's engaged, and, and you can tell they've got a listening ear, and I'll go over and begin to try to talk to them. You know, it's kind of like fishing, you know, you dangle that hook and you know just how to get their attention, and you got one engaged, and sooner or later they're going to bite. And so that's 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 what I like to do. I like I like that conversation piece of it. And so, but maybe you want to get behind the microphone and just begin to share a testimony or something, and uh, you know, or pass out a track and and everything. But be careful passing out tracks, not to scare anybody. I passed out a track. You was with us, wasn't you, Timmy Ray? And and uh, I don't remember. I, I think. I think Patrick handed out a track. You handed the track out. And as the guy took the track, he stuck it in his mouth, began to chew it up. And when he got to me, he spit it in my face. And so, so I chased him down and I grabbed him and spun him around. He thought I was going to, you know, deck him or something. And, and I spun him around and I just began to share the gospel with him. And he was, he was like, you know, I messed up. <laughs> this is one of them preachers that's going to hit back, you know. And, but I wasn't going to hit back, and, and so I shared the gospel with him, was able to talk to him a little bit, and so it worked out pretty good, you know, and uh, I was trying to scare the devil out of him, but I don't know, hopefully, hopefully that seed was sown, amen, and uh, so you, sometimes you just got to take things with a grain of salt and move on, amen, praise the Lord. Well, let's get into our Bible study, um, we got, I got quite a bit I want to try to cover tonight, uh, we're going to try to complete uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3. We know how that goes. It might not happen. We'll stop in an hour and uh, whether we're there or not. Amen. But I wonder, you know, and it's, it's, this is a good um, uh, subject given, uh, you know, the derby coming up and the opportunity to maybe go out and do some witnessing. I wonder, have you ever felt uh, unqualified or underqualified to serve in the ministry? We all have. Amen? We've all felt that way. Underqualified, not qualified, uh, felt as though uh, we're not good enough, that we can't, you know. God, why me? You know, we ask the question, God, why me? God, why would you call me to be pastor? God, would you, why would you call uh, me to be a Sunday school teacher or to do this or to, or to do that in ministry? Why would you call me? You know, we've all asked that question. And, uh, and I, I think that relates a little bit to where we left off last time, because last time Jesus had called his latest disciple, Levi. That's where we left off last week in chapter 2, uh, in verse 14. Look, look in verse 14 of, of chapter 2, we see the calling of Levi, who we know as Matthew. In, in verse 14 of chapter 2, it says, As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up 
and followed him. Now, this was an interesting choice for Jesus to choose Levi. Um, and I would say that Levi, I would be very comfortable in saying that Levi, or we know him as Matthew, probably said those very same things that I said in the beginning. Why me? I'm not qualified. I'm not good enough. He was a tax collector after all. Amen? And, and for Jesus to choose him, it was quite, quite interesting. Um, as we discussed last week, Levi was, was of the uh, tax collecting trade. He was a tax collector. Uh, 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 people hated tax collectors back then. As if we had tax collectors uh, like they did then, we would not like them very much, you know. Not very many people liked the IRS, you know. And, and so uh, 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 that's, just, that's just the, you know, it comes with the trade. Amen. But in this culture and in, in this way things were done, they were uh, often very dishonest and permitted to be so. Uh, they, they, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that they was restricted on. They could be dishonest. They could overcharge. They could make up things. And Rome didn't care as long as they got their money. That's what it boiled down to. Amen. Uh, they were considered traitors who had become friends and loyal to Rome. And so Jesus and his choices for disciples uh, up to this point has been rather interesting. You know, he, 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 uh, most rabbis, when they would choose young disciples, they would be young men that are interested in teaching of the law. They, they want to eventually be teachers. They want to learn, and, and, and they've got some sort of an education, uh, foundation of an education and things like that. But Jesus chose individuals that were not like most disciples. He started off with four fishermen. Fishermen also were generally looked down upon in society. And, and, and they wasn't the most educated. Uh, they, didn't, they weren't necessarily the, the most well-liked in the community. And then he chose a tax collector, who most certainly was not well-liked within the community. It, it, it's, you know, it's interesting, the people that Jesus chooses, even today. Amen. You could say that Jesus so far up to this point had a rather motley crew of disciples, uh, the, the odd bunch, you could say. And he uses this odd selection to change the course of the world. Isn't that interesting? He's going to take 12 men that are not the best selection of men if you were selecting men to follow you. And he's going to use them to be the tools by which he will spread his message that changes the world. Because of those 12 men and the mission of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, and the proclamation of the gospel beginning through those 11 men, we're here today. Amen? We're meeting together today because they carried on the message. So before we begin there in verse 15 where we left off last week, I want to pray. I should have prayed a while ago. Father, I pray that you... Uh, anoint me to teach today. God, I pray that you just, uh, I, I pray for an anointing upon our ears and upon our heart to receive, Lord God, your word. And I pray, God, that you just, uh, you, you cause your word, Lord God, to be so real to us. Lord, that it would speak to our hearts and to our minds, Lord God, that, that, it, would, that it would pierce our hearts, Lord God. And I pray that you help us to, to use your word, Lord God, to live according to your word to apply it to our lives, Lord God, to let it be a lamp into our feet, to let it light our path, Lord God, to illuminate our path as we go and we follow you, Lord God. Help us to be like Levi. Help us to be like James and John and Andrew and, and Peter, Lord God, that we, we just walk away. We walk away from our old self. We walk away from our old lifestyle. We walk away from the things that hold us back. And we follow you. Help us, Lord, to be followers of you. Help us to be those of the way. Lord, that we put you first. That we trust you. That we believe in you. So much so that it changes our lives, Lord God. And I pray that you fill us full of the Holy Spirit. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, in verse 15, that's where we are to begin tonight. In verse 15 of Mark chapter 2. 
It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, uh, eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now Jesus, notice here, Jesus didn't just call Levi, or Matthew as we know him. He went to his house for a meal. He didn't just say, come follow me. He said, come follow me, and he went to his house. Similar to what he does in other tax collectors, Zacchaeus, we'll read about Later, uh, uh, he, he, Zacchaeus is up in a tree. He's a little short guy, kind of like me and Angel. And, and, he, and he's up in a tree so he can see Jesus. And Jesus gets to him and says, Zacchaeus, come down. Because I'm going to your house today. We've all sang that song. We learned that in vacation Bible school and things like that. But he went to his house. He didn't just call him and say, come on, just, just follow me and learn. He went to his house to sit down and to eat with him. It, it reminded me uh, of an, when John wrote in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, many of us know this verse very well. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. This scripture was fulfilled in Levi's calling. Because Jesus didn't just call him, he went and sat down with him. He went to his house. The religious, they, were, they weren't accepting to those uh, of the unclean type. Uh, so they, which, which would be tax collectors and sinners, by the way. And, 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 and so they questioned Jesus' motives because they asked the disciples, they said, why does, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? You see, the religious didn't understand the mission of Jesus' ministry. They didn't understand. They was, they was focused on the negative. They was trying to find everything wrong. You've probably been around somebody in your life since you've been saved, that especially in work or school or whatever it may be, that rather than hearing the positive that you say, they look for the negative. They want to discredit you. And that's not necessarily them as much as the one that's leading them. Amen? They want to find a way to, to, to strip down the message that you have. And, and, and so they didn't understand the mission of his ministry and, 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 and to know that, that, that his mission is to minister to those who are hurting, to minister to those who are sick, to those who are lost in sin. So Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors. Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous but sinners. He called Matthew, a tax collector, hated by society, rather than calling a Pharisee. He didn't go to Nicodemus and ask Nicodemus to be a disciple. Nicodemus became a believer, but he didn't come to him and ask him to be a disciple. He went to Matthew, a tax collector. Many Christians today really need to learn the point to Jesus' statement here that he didn't that, that he's not that it's not the healthy that need a doctor but the sick that he's not come to call the righteous but sinners. And there's many believers today that, that need to, to, to learn that point that Jesus makes there because oftentimes believers look down their noses at certain people who walk into churches. Now I'm not pointing fingers at anybody here today. I don't know that you do that, but I know that Throughout the body of Christ, there's many believers that do that. Because I've heard the comments. I've heard the comments from other people that I've known throughout my walk with Christ that, oh, I don't know what they thought they was doing coming into church today. You know, who do they think they are? Well, they come in to get right, you know. They come in because they know that's where the help is. <laughs> that's where the answer is. That's who I want to see walk through the door. Amen? I'm grateful for believers that come and, and, and begin to come to the church and things like that. But my goodness, oh, I want to see the people that are lost and broken. That's what I want to see. 
I want to see Celebrate Recovery full of people that's been addicted and hurt and, and been, been dealing with things throughout their life and just plumb full of those people, you know? Because that's the people that Jesus went to minister to. That's who we need to minister to. Amen? Those are the ones that we should be reaching out to. The religious, ha, ha, they had it all together. You ever met anybody that had it all together? They think they do, right? They think they've got it all together. And, and, and they, look down, they look down on those who, who don't have it together, not really realizing that, that those that didn't have it together were, were really in need of help as, instead of in need of criticism, you know? And that, that's the problem with the religious in that culture. That's the problem with them today. Uh, we have to be careful not to follow in the footsteps of the religious by being judgmental of those whom we once were. You see, sometimes we forget about that. Sometimes we can be saved for so long that we forget how we used to be. Amen? We forget who we were. We, we should rather follow in the footsteps of Jesus and reach out to those whom we once were. Amen? Now let me just say that, that sometimes Christians get confused as to uh, what it means to hang out with sinners like Jesus did. And I'm, I'm just being straight because that's, that's, this sometimes is, is the issue that, that arises because people want to be like Jesus. They want to, to minister to the, the lost and the broken and, and, and eat with tax collectors and sinners the way Jesus did. And, and sometimes they, they, miss, they miss the mission. And, and because Jesus hung out with and had meals with tax collectors and sinners of all types. However, he never collected taxes. And he never participated in any kind of sin. But there's many people that are believers that hang out with sinners and tax collectors of our day. But rather than just have a meal with them, they participate. Jesus isn't giving us an excuse to participate. We can have a meal with whoever we want to. But that doesn't mean we have to indulge in what they do to keep from hurting their feelings. Because many people use that as an excuse. Well, I, I don't want them to feel like, like I think I'm better than them. Well, no, you're not better than them. You're just more saved than they are. You know? You, you, you've been set free from those things. You need to let them see that you can be free from those things and love them anyhow. You know? You can go have a meal with them or spend some time with them, but you don't have to indulge. You know, it's like when I've known a lot of believers over the years that, that uh, are one way when they're in the pew. But then when they get around their friends at work, or I mean, that's the one place I've experienced it the most. They get around their friends at work, and by the words that come out of their mouth, you cannot tell them apart from anybody else. So they begin to indulge in the things that they do, and they speak with a, a foul mouth and things like that, and there's... You're, you're not setting a good example that way, you know? And so to eat with tax collectors and sinners, you know, that, that's just a, a phrase. You know what that means as in our culture today. Uh, doesn't mean we, sh it, we, we should not indulge in the same things, amen? We're to be different, amen, to be set apart. But we're also to reach out to them in love, amen? Um, verse 18. It says, now John's disciples and the, and the Pharisees were fasting. And some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, can, how can the guest of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. Now, the Pharisees, they were avid fasters. Uh, they fasted at least once, once a week. Uh, they were very religious about that, uh, uh, ritualistic about that. Uh, they, they, they practiced it often. Um, however, they also wanted everyone to know what they was doing. You know, they wanted to be seen by people. Now, fasting was and is a form of mourning, uh, and also a form of protest or petition. Not just biblically speaking, I'm talking about, you know, in the broad spectrum of, across, the, across the globe. 
fat, that's what fasting is. Um, fasting in the New Testament, as you and I know well, because we practice fasting here. You know, you're, you, you hear me throughout the year talking about fasting quite a bit because I believe in fasting. Amen? I've experienced fasting. I've experienced the results of fasting, and therefore I will always preach about fasting. Um, but um, the New Testament uh, um, speaks of fasting, and, and, and we practice fasting because it, it brings a spiritual, uh, a deeper spiritual purpose, uh, um, uh, but it's also a very simple concept. Amen? Uh, fasting, the purpose of fasting is to abstain from food, to weaken the flesh in order to strengthen the spirit. Very simple. Amen? We abstain from food. Now, I know we many times fast other things, and I, that's okay. Amen? Because we live in a different culture. And sometimes you may get more spiritual benefit out of fasting Facebook than you will pizza. You know? Because you might not be addicted to pizza, but you might be addicted to Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever else where you can't put it down. You know, or, or, or uh, um, um, solitaire, that's what I was thinking of. I say that because Dad broke his phone about three or four days ago and he hasn't been able to play solitaire and he's been going crazy. So he's been forced fasting his phone without, without making that choice. Yeah, he needs CR for a phone. <laughs> but actual, in all actuality, fasting is abstaining from food. Amen? Because, you know, we can learn to go without our phone or without our computer or whatever it may be. But it's really hard to go without food because we got to eat, right? And so fasting causes us to weaken our flesh. And when we focus on the Word of God, we focus on prayer, we focus on the presence of God in our life, we grow stronger spiritually. Amen? Uh, fasting is a great help in spiritual growth, but it is not a ritual. And it is not a magic tool to get God to do something. Sometimes we can take it to the extreme and make it seem like we are fasting because we're going to make God move. If you're fasting to make God move, you're just going to be hungry. That's just the way it works. Amen? But if you're fasting because you're doing it sacrificially, something happens spiritually. I honestly can't explain it. I mean, it's a simple concept. We fast, we abstain from food to weaken our flesh in order to, have spirit, to grow spiritually. But fasting is a spiritual discipline. Amen? And the Pharisees, they practiced it in a religious way. And Jesus explained that, that fasting now for the disciples in, in, this, in this text would be silly since the presence of the Son of God, the Messiah, is with them. Since the bridegroom was with them, why should they fast? doesn't make any sense. He's there. You know? It can't get any better than that. You know? This side of heaven. Uh, um. Jesus proclaimed in that statement his true identity. Think about that. Let's look at the text. It says, Jesus answered, he said, how, and this is in verse 19, how can the guest of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have, have him with them, but the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken, taken from them, and on that day they will fast. Jesus is proclaiming his deity. Right there, but yet they don't get it. Some of them, some of them understand what he's saying, and that makes them want to kill him. But, but most that are hearing this don't understand what he's saying. For the disciples to fast would be like attending a wedding and choosing not to eat. You go to a wedding. After the wedding, you have a meal, right? And so if you're invited to the wedding, you go to the meal, and you, and, but the way it's supposed to work is you sit down, you wait, and then when the bride and groom and the wedding party get their food, then you can get your food. So for the disciples to fast would be like you go to the wedding, you're sitting there at the meal, the bride and the groom get up and get their food, the wedding party gets their food, and they're sitting there eating, everybody else is getting their food, but you decide that you're going to fast. Well, you just look weird. You know, eat. You're there to eat, eat. 
And that's what Jesus is saying. For them to fast would be like going to a wedding and just choosing not to eat because the bridegroom is there. They're not waiting on him. He's present. And so that, that's what he's trying to explain. Amen? He explained that soon the bridegroom, who is Jesus, would be taken away from them and then fasting would resume. Then there's a point in fasting. Amen? There's a point in fasting. We see throughout the New Testament the, 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 the reasoning for fasting and, and the importance of fasting. And then Jesus continued to explain his point in the next few verses. Look in verse 21. He says, No one sews a, a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into the old wine skin. Otherwise, the wine uh, will burst the skin and both the wine and the wine skin will be ruined. So, uh, no, they pour new wine into new wine skins. Now, I read this, and, and, and they said this in one commentary. It said, Jesus didn't come to patch up the old religious system. He came to fulfill it and begin something new. Amen? He came to fulfill it and begin something new. I, I, I'm sure many of you remember, uh, uh, as well as I remember, uh, in the frugal days of patching your blue jeans. How many in here has ever patched a pair of blue jeans? Okay. We can tell who's, who's of what generation. <laughs> you know, um, back in those days, uh, and, and some of you remember a lot better than me, um, you'd patch an old pair of blue jeans because who wants to walk around with ripped up blue jeans, Right? Well, that is not the case anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some bright person one day decided to market ripped up blue jeans. And then all of a sudden, the blue jeans that we would try to patch or throw away, or you cut them into shorts. You know, they get so bad you can't patch them anymore, you just cut them off for shorts, you know. And, 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 but somebody decided to market them things one day, and now the, the ones we didn't like so much are worth more than the brand new ones. You know, and it just, it's just, it's, it, it's really strange how things change over time and how society changes. You know, I've got a pair of blue jeans that are wore out and stained up and I like to work in them and they got a rip across the leg and, you know, they would be really fashionable. But if I'm running a chainsaw or weed eating, I get grass in my boots and I don't like it, you know, so I want to patch on those things. So I've been asking Angel to patch them. And in today's society... They're just disposable. I don't know how they're disposable when blue jeans cost $50 or more. I'd just soon patch them. I guess I'm old school. I don't know. But what Jesus is explaining here is that old worn out clothes or an old worn out cloth won't shrink. Amen? This thing's been washed. It's been hung out to dry. It's not going to shrink. It's been through the process. Amen? But, but if you patch it with something new and you wash it, and you hang it out to dry, then all of a sudden that new piece is going to shrink, and it's going to put tension on the old piece, and it's going to rip even more. It's going to make it worse, amen? Or it's going to be all drawled up and look weird. Anybody ever patch something, and then you wash it, and it draws up and looks weird? Yeah. Therefore, the point is, the new and the old don't mix well, amen? They don't mix well. He also used the example of wine skins. Now, in those days, they would use uh, skin to contain wine and sometimes other things like that. And, and, you know, some people would look at that like, man, that's weird. You know, they would take basically leather and, and, and they would, I'm not even going to describe how they would make the thing because it'd bore you to death, but, but they, would, they would make it in such a way that it would hold the liquid, you know. And they would take a, a fresh skin that's, that's, that's been tanned and everything, and then they fill it with wine, and then it hangs there and stretches. Anybody remember the, the leather canteens? Yeah. I, I had one when I was a kid. Uh, I, I, loved, I loved having those little canteens because I had a canteen, a coonskin hat, and a toy uh, uh, Kentucky long rifle because I thought I was Daniel Boone. I even had a Apostles bag and muzzleloader balls that wouldn't fit in my rifle, but I thought they could, you know, and I pretended that they could. I thought I was Daniel Boone, and then sometimes I was saving the Alamo. I was Davy Crockett. 
Absolutely. Well, those can't those old leather canteens that we used to have are very similar to the wine skins. You fill them up with water, you know. But but when you filled those wine skins up with wine, it was fresh, and it would go through the fermentation process, and it would expand. It would stretch that skin. Then that wine would be used, and that skin would dry up. And then if you put new wine in there, that's going to expand. Then that old dried up wine skin would bust. You'd lose the wine skin. You could put water in it, but if you put the wine in it, that's going to ferment and going to expand and build up all that gas and all that stuff. Then it's going to bust. And not only do you lose the wine skin, you lose the wine. And and Jesus is simply he's simply explaining here that 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 there was an old way. Amen. There was an old way, and they don't. It doesn't mix. It doesn't mix. I, I seen a, a preacher preaching on this one time, and he took. Uh, he said he said he used to like to drink uh, um, um, like some kind. He was some kind of coffee. I don't remember what it was. He said, but I like to get up in the mornings and drink orange juice now. And he tried mixing the two together, and uh, it just tastes horrible, you know. And he said the the old way of doing things and the new way of doing things don't mix. Amen. And, and, and that relates to our lives. Amen? It relates to our lives. Uh, um, so to attempt to mix your old self and your old ways with your new self and your new ways in Christ, it doesn't work. Amen? It's not going to work. Your old self must die so that you can be new in Christ. You have to put the old things away. Amen? You have to put the old things away. Lay them aside. And allow him to make you new. Amen. In verse 23. It says. One Sabbath. Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as his disciples walked along. They began to pick some grain heads. Or some heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him. Look. Have you noticed what's transpiring here? Everything Jesus does. It's like. You ever had an inquisitive kid. That is like. In your business all the time asking you, why are you doing that? What are you doing that for? You know? <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> I won't. But Teddy, if you're watching, Dad said your name. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, my kids was that way. Uh, Timmy Ray, not so much. He didn't really like to ask questions. But Isaiah is always in my business, always asking questions and trying to figure things out. Uh, Timmy Ray would just watch and then try to figure it out himself, and then I would have destroyed uh, stuff because he would take wheels apart from wagons and bearings would be everywhere, and and he's just experimenting, you know, trying to invent things and taking things apart. And but Isaiah would ask the questions, but but we've all been around somebody like that that's constantly just kind of getting on your nerves, and you know, and and. and <laughs> But the Pharisees were like that. Everything Jesus was doing, they're right there on the outside and they're just waiting and watching for him to do something. And they're like, hey, hey, what, why are you doing that? Gotcha. That's exactly what they're doing. Gotcha now. But, but they, was, they was failing every time. So far, let me go on and finish reading that. I kind of stopped. But the Pharisees said to him, verse 24, look at, why they are, uh, look at what they are doing. They're doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Jesus answered, verse 25. He says, have you ever read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the, in the days of uh, Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate of the consecrated bread, which is lawful for only priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. And then he, uh, he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man. Not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, farmers were required in those days to leave the edges of their fields unharvested so that the poor and the travelers could reap enough to to eat as they walked along. Now, I think it should still be that way. You know, not only for the poor, traveler, or whatever, but because of wildlife. And I'm not going to even get on that, but that's why you don't ever hear a Bob White quail anymore. Just saying, because they don't, they reap all the way to the field edges. 
Moving on. I'll get on a, I'll get on a soapbox here. But, but however, reaping for a farmer uh, was forbidden on a Sabbath. Amen? He couldn't go out and reap in his field. Um, now, what the disciples were doing in this case, they weren't harvesting. They weren't even reaping. You ever walk through a field or in some tall grass and there's some fescue or orchard grass or something, got the little seeds on top and you just run your finger up the stem and pull them off? That is essentially what they was doing. As they're walking, they just would run their hand up, get some of it, they put it in their hand, they'd rub it to get the chaff off of it, and then blow the chaff away and they got the grain, they'd eat the grain. As they're walking along. Now, you could say, well, they're walking so they're breaking the Sabbath. Well, no, they're headed to the synagogue because in, according to the law, you could walk a Sabbath day's journey, which was a certain distance where I'm not going to get into all that right now. But, but you could walk a Sabbath day's journey. So they're not breaking the law by walking, and they're not breaking the law by getting a little bit of grain, roll it in their hands as they walk, and smacking on the grain. Nothing wrong with that. And, and it, it really isn't, it isn't breaking the law at all. And so that, that's basically what they were doing as they walked along. The Pharisees were not referring necessarily to the law of Moses when they are accusing Jesus and accusing the disciples, but rather to the traditions of the law that's instituted by man, not of God. Uh, they were referring to the Talmud. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Talmud or not, but that's where the priests added a whole bunch to the law. Amen? Like a whole lot to where it's impossible. It was impossible to begin with, but they made it even more impossible. And, and, and some of their rules were just, you, you would have to look at some, it's just weird. But according to the Talmud, the disciples were in violation of the law, and therefore they were sinners because they pulled some grain off of the, off of the stem, and they began to roll it in their hands and smack on the grain as they're walking, going to a synagogue. By grabbing some of the grain as they walked, they were reaping, according to the Pharisees. By rolling the grain in their hands to break away the husk and, the, and all of that, they were threshing, according to the Pharisees. And then by then, blowing away the chaff in their hand as they walked along, they were winnowing. And then by eating the grain, they were preparing a meal. Therefore, they are dirty, rotten sinners according to the Pharisees. It, it seems a little legalistic, does it not? Just, just a little? But th that's what happens when man adds to what God has to say. Amen? We become very legalistic. Uh, Jesus then points out their lack of understanding of the Scriptures, but he also reveals uh, uh, something to me was very interesting. But he, he points out an incident that transpired with David as he was running from his father-in-law Saul. You'll find this story in 1 Samuel 21, uh, verses 1 through 6, and, and I'm not going to turn there for the sake of time. But uh, David, he was running from his father-in-law Saul. David had already been anointed king, and, and, and he, him and his men are hungry. They don't have nothing to eat. So they go uh, to the priest, and he asks for something to eat, and all he had was the showbread, which was consecrated bread. Only the priest could eat the bread. And David said, well, give that to us. And the priest was like, well, you're not supposed to eat that. And David was like, we've got to eat something. And the priest says, well, have, is your, have your man done, have they been doing this or that, you know, without going into great detail? And he said, no, we haven't done nothing like that. So he gave them the showbread. And they ate it. And Jesus is bringing this up. He says, do you not, do you not remember that David ate the showbread? Do you not remember this? And then Jesus explained, he said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And saying that, Jesus again, that's twice in just a few verses, that he claimed his deity. Amen? That's why the Pharisees hate him. And I'll explain that in the next chapter. But, but I want you to think about this. David was anointed as king. His rightful place was on the throne as king, right? He's running from Saul, who was king at the time, because Saul wanted to kill him. Why did he want to kill him? Because he knew David's rightful place was on the throne. He knew that he had been replaced by David, so he wanted to kill David. 
And so because his father-in-law is chasing him, he had no choice but to eat the consecrated bread. Jesus, his rightful place is king. Amen? He is the Messiah, the Son of God. And the very ones that are accusing him don't recognize him for who he is. They are plotting to kill him. If the situation wasn't so, Jesus wouldn't have had to stay on the outskirts of town. They wouldn't have been walking along at the edge of the field taking a little bit of grain as they walked to the synagogue. You see the relation there? David wasn't in his rightful place because he wasn't recognized as king. Jesus wasn't in his rightful place because he was not recognized as king. They didn't believe him. Amen? So let, let's begin here in, in, verse, in chapter 3. See how far we can get. In chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. And some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely, still doing the same thing. They're watching him closely, looking for something to catch him on. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. And then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. And, and he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts and said to the man, <coughs> Excuse me. And said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. And then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now, in this portion of the gospel, it's also told in, in Matthew and in Luke, this, this, this story here. Um, and, and some would say that there is some contradiction, especially when you look at Matthew compared to Mark or Matthew compared to Luke. <coughs> Excuse me, I need to... <clears throat> Now, in Matthew's uh, description of this story, this is what he says. This is in Matthew chapter 12, verse 9 through 10. Let me just go ahead and say, the Bible never contradicts itself. Amen? There, there's a reason. There's a reason for everything that's that, that said the way it's said. Uh, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 9 through 10, it says this. It says, going from that place, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, he went into their synagogue. And a man with a shriveled hand was there, and looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now, I don't know if you noticed or not, but according to Mark, it says, <clears throat> then Jesus, verse 4, then Jesus asked them. Matthew says, the Pharisees asked Jesus, but Mark and Luke say, Jesus asked them. Now, people can get all... Tied up in knots over that, but it's really quite simple. <clears throat> Jesus commonly would repeat a question. I mean, we see that through the Gospels. They would ask him something, and he would ask him a question right back. He would, he would bring it up again and respond to it. Amen? <clears throat> All three accounts tell us that the Pharisees were looking for a way to trap Jesus. When you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all three begin by saying that they were looking for a way to trap Jesus. <clears throat> now, everyone knew where to find Jesus on the Sabbath. He always went to the synagogue. He always went to the synagogue. He was either there to visit the synagogue or he taught in the synagogue every Sabbath. And wherever, Whichever synagogue he was at, there were synagogues all over Israel and he would go to different ones, not always the same one. And now, everyone knew where to find him, so he would be in a synagogue somewhere, so it would be right to think that the Pharisees most likely planted this man with the shriveled hand in the synagogue for the purpose of trapping Jesus because they were looking for a way to trap Jesus. Amen? So it wouldn't be wrong to think that because um, <clears throat> they wanted to catch him doing something unlawful according to them. So the chain of events in, in this story must have obviously played out this way. <clears throat> they planted the man in the synagogue. They presented the question, according to Matthew, 
Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Asking Jesus this question. And Jesus called the man out of the crowd in and in front of everyone. Did you notice that? He, he called the man. He says, come here. I want you to come out in front of everybody. He's going to make an example. And then he proposed the question, is it lawful to do good? Jesus did. They, they initially asked the question according to Matthew. And then Jesus had him come out in front of everybody. And he, then he asked the question again to the crowd. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? <clears throat> and then in, in, in anger and frustration with the crowd and with the religious, Jesus asked the man to stretch out his hand. And then he healed him. And then the religious, with their bruised feelings, they plotted to kill Jesus and they went away. Now, in Matthew's account alone, Jesus elaborates on, on something else that, or Matthew elaborates on something else that Jesus said. In Matthew 12, verses 11 through 12, it says this. It says, He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it, fails, and it falls into a pit, on the Sabbath will you... Uh, uh, w- and it falls into the pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So he points out then in all their religious devotion to God, because they were religious and they were devoted. You, You can't deny that. The Pharisees were very religious and very devoted. Amen. They were committed people in their service. But in all of that devotion, they would put more value on an animal than they would on man. They used this man. If they, if, they, if they actually did put him there and planted him there to tempt Jesus, they used him. They used him and, and his, his, his uh, in, in, infirmity and, and, and his problem to tempt Jesus to do something that they wanted to do. They were using him. So they put more value on things such as animals than they do man. And a man, that would preach, honestly, in 2024. Because that's the culture that we're in. People do often put more value on animals than they do people. And it's an epidemic, to be honest. It's a very, very much an epidemic. Anyway, I'm going to move on from that, too. In verse 7, it says, And Jesus withdrew from his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. And when they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, uh, Jerusalem, uh, Idumea, and, and, and the regions across the Jordan, and around Tyre and Sidon. <clears throat> because, the crowd, uh, because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had, healed many, uh, he had healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. And whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. Now, I don't even have this in my notes, but, but this just, it always intrigues me. All of these people are following Jesus for miracles. They're not following him because they believe he's the son of God. Some are, but majority of the crowd's not. The Pharisees, they're so well-versed in the word of God. I mean, they know it so well. They know it way better than any of us do because they didn't have personal Bibles and iPhones and iPads and all these things they carried around with them all the time. They had it here. They knew it. They could quote it. Amen? I mean, they could sit down and write it out. But the only ones that are confessing who Jesus really is, is the demonic spirits. Isn't that crazy? Only the demonic spirits are confessing Christ. And he's present on earth in the presence of people. In the presence of those who are looking for him. And they don't even realize he's there. Even Jesus, it says in verse 7 that Jesus withdrew from the crowd, or withdrew with his disciples to the lake. Even Jesus withdrew to get away, get some relief from the crowds. Amen? I, I don't know about you. Sometimes I, I, sometimes I don't mind being in a crowd. Sometimes I do not want to be in a crowd of people. You know? Um, 
He even had his disciples go before him and prepare a boat to keep the crowd keep the crowds from crowding him. Now, some translations translate that word, and it can be translated as crushing instead of crowding him to keep them from crushing him. Now, I'm sure some of you have been in in in, in crowds that to where you feel, you know, like they're you're just you're just kind of going with the flow because the crowd of people are pushing you a certain direction, you know. And I and I've been in crowds like that. And, um, and and you can see how if you slip and fall, you can get trampled pretty easy because the crowd's just going to push people right over you, you know. And so Jesus, the crowd must have been similar to that, and Jesus had them get a boat and put him, that way he could get away from the crowd. Now, if you could, try to picture the crowds that are following Jesus. It's not like a New York City street or being down there on the streets there in Derby and, and things like that where you're, you know, walking in a big crowd. I mean, think about this. These people are trying to push through the crowd to get to him. They just want to touch him. They've heard the stories. They've heard about all this going on. The people who are sick, that are desperate for healing, people that are, that are possessed by demonic spirits, uh, you know, that are seeking freedom. Uh, from these things, I mean, they're pressing through. They're trying to get to him. The issue is that many of these people in the crowds were seeking Jesus for what he could do rather than what he had to say. Even today, it's that way many times. That, it's that way many times that people are seeking Jesus for what he can offer rather than what he has to say. Amen? And sometimes... <clears throat> ministries cater to that in that we have more programs than we do the Word. You know, and I, I'm just, you know, we try not to do that here, but I know that it happens, amen? And, and, and we look for programs and ways to draw people in. Sometimes God hasn't called you to have a church with five or 600 people, you know? I mean, sometimes it just doesn't work that way. You be obedient to the Word, amen? You present the Word of God. Give me right where'd you park? Okay. I seen somebody walk up to the back door a while ago, and then I just seen a car pull out from beside my truck. So I don't know what was going on. You might walk out there and check it out. <clears throat> I just usually you park there and I thought, well, somebody just left in your truck. <laughs> was there? Okay. I just want to make sure somebody wasn't there out there stealing stuff. Anyway, where was I at? Yes, yes. Um, no, I, w I was talking about, you know, sometimes people seek Jesus for what he has to offer rather than what he has to say. And I was talking about the programs in, in oftentimes in ministries. You know, and, and we got to, we got to, you know, programs are good. Things like that are great, and they are. But the word has to be the most important thing. Amen? That has to be the most important thing. Verse 13. <clears throat> I got five minutes. We, we might get, well, we get through this next section at least. <clears throat> Verse 13, it says, Jesus went up on the mountainside and called to him those, uh, those he wanted. And they came to him, and he appointed the twelve, and he appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might uh, send them out to preach, and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed: Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter; James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name. Um, and let me try to find where I wrote this out. How to pronounce that? I wrote it out somewhere. Uh, Boanerges, Boanerges. That's how that's how it's supposed to be pronounced. Uh, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, uh, Matthew, Thomas, James, uh, son of Alphaeus, uh, Thaddeus, Simon, the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So that's the list of the disciples. Amen. Jesus selected his core group out of all of those who followed him. We don't know exactly how many people followed Jesus. But we know it was a lot of people. Amen? A lot of those crowds that he talked about that could crush him, 
Some of them were those just seeking him for the miracles, and some of them were true disciples. Amen? We don't know the number. But we know that out of that number, he picked 12. Amen? He picked 12 men. Um, Jesus wanted 12 men chosen by him to be with him so that they might learn and then be sent out to preach. These men were in a discipleship program to become apostles. Apostles mean sent ones, or one who is sent out. Amen? So they're, they're, they're the ones that will be apostles. Uh, Mark mentions each of the 12 disciples. Uh, they're also mentioned in Matthew, they're mentioned in Luke, and they're mentioned in Acts. Um, John doesn't mention all 12 disciples. One thing you'll notice whenever you see the 12 disciples mentioned is Peter's always mentioned first. He's always mentioned first. Um, Peter, who we see also called Simon, um, who although Jesus set him aside as a leader, he had some issues at times. Amen? He, ha he had some issues with doubt, and he had some issues with anger. He was outspoken. He would uh, stick his foot in his mouth, you know, and, and, and speak a little too soon sometimes, so much so that Jesus had to say, get behind me, Satan, you know. Uh, that's, that's Peter. Uh, but he was also ambitious, he was brave, and he was very committed. Amen? That's who Peter was. Uh, uh, you also will notice that James is always mentioned before his brother John. This may have hurt John's feelings, I don't know, because when John wrote his gospel, how did he describe himself? He's the one that Jesus loved, and he wanted everybody to know that he beat Peter to the tomb. You know, that, that's John. He, he wanted people to know that about him. Um, and, and you'll notice that Judas is always mentioned last as the one who betrayed Jesus. Uh, Jesus also had a core group within the twelve. And that core group was Peter, James, and John. Amen? Peter, James, and John. You know, they all three were fishermen. Somehow Andrew got left out, Peter's brother. I don't know how he got left out of the mix of the, of the three. Jesus just needed the core three, not four. And I, we don't know what happened to Andrew. Amen? But, but um, Peter, James, and John was the core group out of the twelve. James and John, the brothers, were also given the nickname Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder. It's believed that they may have gained this, this label because of something they, they had said to Jesus. In, in Luke chapter 9, verse 52 through 56. I'm almost done, if you just give me a few minutes. In, in verse 52, it says, And he sent messengers on ahead who went into, the, into a Samaritan village to get things ready for them, or get things ready for him, but the people there did not, uh, did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and then he and his disciples went into another village. That could be why they're called the sons of thunder. They wanted to be like Elijah, called down fire from heaven. But there's also another time when they asked a very bold question to Jesus in Mark chapter 10, verse 35. It says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Not we want to do for you, Jesus, whatever you ask. We want you to do for us, Jesus, whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. And they replied, let us one sit at your right hand and the other at your left in glory. And Jesus is like, you don't even understand what you're asking. <laughs> so maybe that's another reason they're called the sons of thunder. But Judas, who was always mentioned last, is mentioned as the one who betrayed Jesus. And some might say, why did Jesus ever select Judas? Well, to fulfill prophecy. Amen? It's quite that simple. Uh, Jesus knew from the beginning why he selected Judas. Um, an interesting thing about Judas, his last name is not really his last name. It tells us where he's from. He's from just outside of Judea. And, and so it's not even, they didn't have last names back then. Um, it's usually you're the son of so-and-so, you know. Um, <clears throat> but the remaining 12 disciples, we don't know a whole lot about. I mean, we know some, uh, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to dive into all that. Um, but, but, you know, I heard somebody say it like this. Their fame is reserved for heaven. Their fame is reserved for heaven. 
You know, for me, and I want to close with this, um, the, uh, for me, I'm excited, of course, to meet Jesus. You know, uh, whenever I'm called home or whenever the rapture takes place, I am so excited to meet Jesus. But I cannot wait to meet Paul and Peter. Can't wait. Every time I read the gospel accounts and I read through the book of Acts, it, um, it intrigues me. Because I'm like, Lord, you know, these men didn't have, they didn't have what we have. You know, uh, e even as they're following Jesus, they didn't have the infilling of the Holy Spirit the way we have. Even after Jesus ascended into heaven and the Holy Spirit come into their life, they didn't have the Word of God at their fingertips the way we do. They didn't have the freedoms to go and to minister the way we do. They had to be in fear of their lives. They lived in constant fear of their lives throughout their entire ministry and the rest of their life after meeting Jesus. We meet Jesus and we live comfortably. And many times I think about this and I think, Lord, I'm intrigued by these men. I want to be like these men, but Lord, I don't want to suffer the way they did. You know, I want to have that passion. I want to have that desire to see people come to Christ. And I hope when you read through the gospel, you see the same thing. I hope it drives you to want to see people saved. Amen? Well, let's pray. Anybody got any prayer requests? I got to find me an ink pen. Anybody got any prayer requests? Paul? Amen. Cecilia. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Danielle? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You had your hand up. Mm. Are they like tornadoes coming or already came? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. Wow. Did one of y'all have your hand up? Amen. Anybody else? And all right, let's pray. Father, we just come to you tonight and we lift these needs before you. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much, Lord, that you, you took all of this to the cross already. You, you took it all and paid the penalty for all of it, for our healing, for our needs, for, for our transgressions, for our salvation, Lord God. You've, you've already paid the price for all of it. And Lord, we just ask, Lord God, for your, your help. We ask for your provision. We ask for your healing, Lord God. We ask for your favor in Jesus' name. And Father, we lift these needs. We lift up uh, Paul's sister-in-law, Cecilia. Lord God, we pray for healing. Lord, that you just, you just work miracles. 
Lord God, in her life. And, and Lord God, I pray that if she doesn't know you, that Lord, through this, you, you bring her closer. Lord God, you knock on her door and, and, and that you send people in her path. Lord God, to speak life into her in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up Karen. Lord God, we pray for healing to her, Lord God. God, that you just you just minister and, and guide the doctors and help them to, uh, to figure out the issue, Lord God. And, and, and Lord, then we, play, we pray, God, that you just move mightily. Lord God, we pray for recovery. We pray for healing, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we pray for little Sawyer that you help him to, to catch up, to gain weight, Lord God. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray that you just, uh, you, you just cause him to put on the pounds like his daddy's been doing for a while. Lord God, in Jesus' name, and Lord, we thank you for it. Lord, we pray for Sandy. Lord God, we don't know exactly uh, what, what's going on there, but Lord, whatever this reaction is or, or whatever's causing it, Lord, that you just, you just intervene, Lord God, just as you brought her through this, this, this cancer scare, Lord God, that you bring her through this, Lord God. We pray for, for healing, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for Eileen's family in Oklahoma and all those impacted, Lord God, by these uh, 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 tornadoes, Lord God. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, I pray that you provide for them. God, I pray that you just begin to send, send help their way, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Give them comfort, Lord God. Provide for their needs, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up Spencer. Lord, we pray for continued healing to that little baby. God, that he's able to eat and, and he's able to, to digest, Lord God, and to, to, to be able to do things on his own, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we pray for his, his parents, Lord God. Lord, that you comfort them and help them to be patient, Lord God, and to have faith, Lord God, believing that you can work this out. And God, I pray. Lord, we pray together, believing, Lord God, for healing for little Spencer. Lord, we just pray for Timmy Ray, Lord God, that, that, that these these uh, uh, blood test results, Lord God, that it's not a big deal. Lord God, that you just work it out, Lord, that it's, 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 that it's, not, that it's a non-issue, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, just work it out for him like you've continued to work things out for him throughout this whole process, God. Oh, hallelujah. And Lord, we pray for, for Abigail, Lord God. We pray for Angel, Lord, and these allergies or whatever they're dealing with, Lord God. We pray for healing, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that they can breathe. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Lord, we just give you praise for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray that you be with all of us, Lord God, as we leave. Help us, Lord God, to be a light. Lord God, help us to, uh, to just trust you in our day in and day out activities, Lord God, to put our faith in you. Help us to be people of prayer, people of the word, Lord God. Hallelujah. People of faith, Lord God, and people that believe and share in our faith. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, we pray for Jerry as he's traveling this way, Lord God. We pray that you just protect him, Lord God. Lord, keep him safe and help him to get here without any complications, Lord. And Father, I pray, Lord God, that you give him a favor out on the streets, Lord God. And, and those who will be going with him, if, I pray that you begin to stir in people, Lord God, to, to want to go out and to learn the ropes, Lord God, of how to share their faith and and God, I pray that you, uh, you just work this out, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, that, that those of us that go out, Lord God, that you give us favor, that you give us souls, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Give us the words to speak and prepare the hearts, Lord God, of people that are going to come in contact with the preachers down there and those sharing their faith, Lord God. Prepare their hearts, Lord God, that their hearts are ready for the seed that's going to be sown, Lord God. And I pray that many of them, Lord God, will find themselves in a church Sunday. Lord, that they will be, and they will encounter the King of Kings there at that, that day. When they're going to see a horse race, Lord, they go there expecting to see a race. They're expecting to, to have a good time. And Lord, I pray they encounter you. I pray they encounter you there, Lord God, and find themselves the next morning. Lord God, sitting in a pew, listening to your word and coming to know you, Lord. And Father, I pray that you be with us, Lord God. I pray that you protect us, put your hand upon us, Lord God. I pray for a good time uh, tomorrow as we uh, have National Day of Prayer, Lord God, in Shepherdsville and in LJ. Lord God, I pray, Lord, for your favor. God, I pray for good weather. And I pray, Lord God, that you're, you're just, uh, you're exalted, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you and we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.